Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading comes from Exodus uh, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and called it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm glad to be back with you today and looking at the Ten Commandments. It has been a, a joy just the, the time of study. Uh, I was on vacation last week, so I'm... I'm uh, ready to go. Now, I'm glad to be back with you today. Uh, What we saw in the first commandments, and I I want to uh, reiterate something I said early on uh, about the commandments. Um, The commandments are the words of God. They don't save us. They're not our path to salvation, but they do show us who God is. Um, One thing that you might need to know uh, about the two Testaments, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, it's an idea. It's known as progressive revelation, where we know more about God as he continues to reveal himself to us. We saw it with Adam and Eve in the garden, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We see it here with Moses, and we see it most fully in the person of Jesus Christ when God took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, What you saw here today is an expression of who God is. He's a God that leaves the 99 and chases after the one. He's the God who finds us hopeless and helpless, and he ultimately offers himself for us that we might find salvation in him. And so while we might see the God of the Old Testament, you should know that's not the full story. There is more to who God is, but he began by revealing himself to us in the Ten Commandments, saying, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh, the sovereign God of the universe who spoke all that you know and see into existence. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He is a God who is wholly other than us. He says, I am the Lord, but I'm the Lord your God. I'm a personal God who knows you, who sees you, who hears you, who knows the situation that you are in. This great, big, powerful God knows us and pursues us. He says, you shouldn't make any graven images, cast idols, carved images. Uh, You shouldn't bow down and worship them. He goes on, as Lopez preached last week, uh, you you shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. And that's not merely things that we speak, but it's taking on the name of Jesus Christ, the banner of Christ in our lives, and then living in a way that would be contrary to the nature and character of God. Now today, we're going to hit an interesting uh, commandment. And I remember this was exemplified some when I was younger. Um, It is the fourth commandment, you shall honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. I'll read the text in just a minute. Uh, But as a kid, I remember you weren't supposed to work on Sundays, right? Uh, I remember my, my grandpa, we would go to my granny's house. We would eat pot roast, as every good American should on Sunday, right? Go to grandma's, eat pot roast. And uh, my grandpa would sit in his recliner and fall asleep watching the Dallas Cowboys. So we should remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? Uh, the Sabbath is one of those things that is a, a little bit, well, it's confusing to us as a culture. In particular, um, it's a part of the Old Covenant, but we're a New Covenant people. But we don't disregard the other commandments of the Ten Commandments. So what are we to do? with the Sabbath? That's the question I ultimately want to answer for you today. Uh, But first, I want to hopefully outline a bit of what the Sabbath is. I want to read the text for you here, uh, and then we'll kind of walk our way through it. So Exodus chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 8, it says, remember the Sabbath day. Now, this is an interesting thing. The Sabbath did not originate on Mount Sinai when God was talking to Moses. Uh, The Sabbath actually originates in creation. God created on six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Prior to going up on Sinai, you you have Moses talking to the nation of Israel about the manna that they would find on the ground. And he said, six days you're supposed to gather manna, but on the sixth you gather double because you don't work on the seventh. And so Sabbath is not a new concept, but God is calling them to remember the day that he has set aside, the day that he made holy, the day that he blessed. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, set aside Set apart for God. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, if you're a a Hebrew scholar, or even if you aren't, you might know this word. Uh, Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to cease 
or to rest. And I want you to see what God was doing for his people. I want you to see what God was doing for the nation of Israel who'd spent the last 400 years enslaved in Egypt. You know, when you're a slave, you don't get to decide when you want to work and when you want to rest, when you want to start in the mornings and when you want to quit. As a matter of fact, a slave is a person whose worth is tied up to the amount of work that they can perform. And there in Egypt, they had high quotas, harsh taskmasters. They were beaten if they didn't meet their quota of bricks. And God leads them out of slavery in Egypt. He's leading them toward the promised land. He set them free from slavery. And he institutes the Sabbath for his people. And in the Sabbath, he's saying, your worth is not in your work. Your worth, can I say this to you as well? Your worth before God is not tied to the amount of work that you can perform for him. Your value to God, his love for you, is not tied to the work that you would ultimately do for him. In the Sabbath, we have this reminder that in the midst of people who probably still could have been productive, they likely worked seven days a week at times in Egypt. God says, I want you to set aside a day that I don't want you to do any work. In our, in our ceasing and in our resting, we're reminded that God is at work even while we're at rest that God is the one who is in control, that God is the one who provides for us, even when you need a little extra cash, right? Even when the, uh, the Israelites were in the wilderness and they weren't sure where their meals were going to come from, right? I want you to rest on the seventh day. And I want you to remember the God who works for you. Remember what God has done. And so uh, every seventh day, the nation of Israel, they wouldn't work. And God was pretty descriptive about what that looked like. He says in, in verse uh, 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, and on it you shall not do any work, not you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or even the sojourner who is within your gates. And so what, what God is saying here, because you know how you are, men, right? You might work six days and be like, oh, no big deal. I got a son, right? He can mow the lawn. He can do the things for me. He can keep the farm going. He can continue to do the things that need to be done. Or if not your child, then your slave. And if not your slave, then maybe the foreigner who is in your midst, because he doesn't belong to God, right? He's not a part of the nation of Israel. Why can't he work? And yet what God was doing here wasn't just giving a blessing to the nation of Israel, but it radiated out that there was a day a week in which labor would cease, in which men and women and even beasts could rest, slaves and free people, and even the foreigner. This was expression of God, his goodness and his blessing to his people. The Sabbath was a reminder that they're no longer slaves. They're no longer enslaved to their work or to any other thing, but rather they're now slaves to God, who is a gracious God who gives them the seventh day off. Now, um, in, in verse 9, uh, we are told uh, that the Israelite people were to do their labor for six days. I want to be really clear. Labor is a good thing. Our work is of God. However, when our master is God, we don't work for pay. We don't work for glory or to honor other people. We work for the glory of God. And he is a gracious God who in turn provides for us and gives us the seventh day to rest. And it continues on there in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so the nation of Israel, they were very specific about keeping the Sabbath. There were very specific rules about what you could and couldn't do. Uh, you couldn't kindle a fire. If you wanted to build a fire, it was out on the Sabbath. Um, you couldn't gather manna, clearly. Uh, you couldn't sell goods or bear burdens. Now, there were some things that you could do, acts of mercy, if someone's ox falls into a ditch, or someone, for that matter, you were allowed to take the ox out of the ditch. You were allowed to do some things that would have been considered gracious acts to other people, service to other people, so um, it would have been okay to deliver a, a meal to your neighbor, for example. You were allowed to do that sort of thing. Now, can you imagine how this commandment would affect our society if all of a sudden America the fastest-paced, most consumeristic, busiest society in the history of the world, if one day a week everything ceased. And it would be a blessing for most of us, right? We just stopped and we rested. 
but it would also bless people who maybe aren't as well off as we are. People that are forced to work weekends because that's all they can get. And it would bless uh, people that would radiate out from just Christians, but uh, really across our city and our town, that things could cease and have a day where everything stopped. And so one component of the Sabbath was rest. And man, it was a blessing to the people. This was not a burdensome command. As a matter of fact, the Sabbath wasn't a day of fasting. It was to be a day of feasting where you enjoyed all that God had given to you. Okay, now the other component of Sabbath was remembering the work of the Lord. So on the Sabbath day, the Israelite people, they would have a meal perhaps that had already been prepared, and they would gather maybe their family together, and they would talk about, do you remember what God did? Do you remember when we were slaves in Egypt? Remember how hard that was and we cried out to God? And our great God, He heard us, and He saw us in our labor, and God acted on our behalf. And he just stacked those plagues up against Pharaoh. He just crushed Pharaoh who let us go. Remember how he split the sea and we walked across on dry land? Remember how God has fed us with manna, water from the rock? And they would take a day to remember the work of God on their behalf. The Sabbath was a blessing. It was a day set aside to the Lord. They would enjoy meals together and they would pray and they would worship and honor the Lord on the Sabbath day. Now, I mentioned that God took it very seriously. I want to read you a quick uh, section from Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 17. This is how seriously God took the Sabbath. It says, The Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and to say, Above all you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. I'm the, I, the Lord, have called you unto myself. I have made you a people holy to me. I'm the one who delivered you out of slavery, and I don't want you to forgive it. Keep the Sabbath. And I've given you this as a sign to remember that I'm the one who sanctifies you. Continuing on, he says, verse 14, You should keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you, and everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Again, God was very serious about the Sabbath. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, to, holy to the Lord. And whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing it throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So hopefully that's a fair overview. A Sabbath was a day of rest and remembrance of the Lord and what he had done. It was a very clear command that God took very seriously among his people. So the question that uh, we need to address today is what about for us? We have all the other commandments, and I would absolutely say that you should obey them. What about the Sabbath? How should we as believers, disciples of Jesus, followers of him, um, thousands of years later, how should we handle and treat the Sabbath? Is this still a binding thing for us, or uh, can we just kind of do whatever we want and not worry about it? Uh, I'm going to answer that for you, but I, I want to give you a couple of uh, things first. Uh, just to summarize what we know about the Sabbath, it is a day set aside for rest and worship. Um, it's a blessing from God. Um, and the same would be true for us, by the way. That we could have a day set aside for rest. That's a blessing from the Lord. To be reminded that we're not enslaved to our jobs. But rather we are followers of God. To remind our families that we're not enslaved to our hobbies, to our ball teams or anything other thing. But there's a day that we set apart for the Lord. That seems to be profound for us, right? Jesus tells us in Mark 2, 27, 28, goes on and talks about the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath was made for man um, not man for the Sabbath. It's a blessing to us. So it's a day set aside for rest and worship. It's a blessing to us, and it's very, very important. So those are the three things I want you to know. Um, now, there is some disagreement among Christians today about whether or not we should continue this practice where, you know, in this case, in the Old Testament, the Israelites practice it on the seventh day, and God is pretty clear here about the seventh day, that you should keep it holy um, I want to give you a few reasons that uh, other people may give you for why you should keep it. Uh, the first is this. 
Um, the Sabbath was grounded in creation and God's own example, uh, not merely the covenant God made with Moses at Sinai, right? So when we think about Sabbath, we should look back to creation. We should look to God's own example. So some people would say, because God did it, we should do it, right? It was his pattern. He set forth for us in creation, and we should just continue that on. Okay, um, we see it in Genesis chapter 2, we see it in Exodus 16, it carries all the way through for us. And as a matter of fact, we just read the passage in Exodus 31 that says it's a lasting covenant, right? So maybe we should keep the Sabbath. Um, on top of that, God saw fit to place it within this command, within the Ten Commandments, which kind of codify God's moral law. It's kind of the central statement of the moral law in the Old Testament. And that's pretty weighty, right? Uh, the final thing um, we see that the Israelites in the Old Testament, the New Testament church, and Christians throughout history have set aside a day to worship the Lord, right? So maybe we should keep the Sabbath, right? And I would say, sort of, all right? Not exactly. What you and I should never do is attempt to keep the law in the sense that the Old Testament, the Israelite people did under the Old Covenant. And the reason that we don't keep the Sabbath in the same way that they do is because we, by the grace of God, are under a new and better covenant. And those aren't my words. That, that would be, uh, we find that in Pauline literature. We find it in the, in the book of Hebrews. We are under a new and better covenant. So um, I want to give you a few reasons why Sabbath observance is not a part of the new covenant. Now, just to be really clear, if you set aside time for your family, and you want to keep a Sabbath, we'll get into this a little more in a minute, um, I want to high-five you and say, man, you're a great dad. You're a great mom. Like, you should do that. It is worshipful to the Lord. If you feel convicted to do that, you should absolutely do it. However, um, it is not a law that is binding upon believers, and here's why. Number one, um, the Sabbath was a sign of the covenant God made with Israel through Moses. Um, if you'll remember when, when God made a covenant, the Abrahamic, if you want big nerdy speech, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the sign of that covenant was circumcision, right? That's how you knew that you were one of God's people. Uh, you had to undergo circumcision. Um, the Mosaic covenant, the sign was the Sabbath. And yet you and I, we're now in a new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, a covenant that looks not to circumcision, not to Sabbath observance to set us apart, but rather we look to faith in Jesus Christ. We are baptized identifying with Him. And so Sabbath was a sign of the old covenant. Because we're under a new covenant, we don't have to. This is Exodus 31, 13. I want to read it for you again to see that it was a sign of the old covenant. You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign of between me and you throughout your generations that you, that, uh, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So again, God gave Sabbath as a sign. But that's not all. That's just the first reason, right? Sabbath is a sign of God's covenant. The number two, number two the Sabbath pointed toward Christ. Now imagine you're a member of the nation of Israel. And if you read um, kind of the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, you're going to read in there a whole lot of law. And if you've ever read it, you know that you have absolutely blown it. If you just read the Ten Commandments, you know, man, I've fallen short. Like, I cannot keep this. And yet the people of Israel, they had the Day of Atonement once per year, Yom Kippur. Uh, your sins were atoned for by the blood of a goat or a ram or a lamb. And so you would watch as the priest would come and lay hands on that little lamb and watch as its blood was shed for you on the Day of Atonement. Year after year after year. And yet within that sacrificial system, the law that was given to the old people was a lesson that God desperately wanted us to learn. And the lesson was this, that we cannot do it on our own, that we can never uh, be righteous enough before God. The law was given us as a tutor to lead us to the understanding that we needed a Messiah. And it was true of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a sign. It pointed toward what God was ultimately going to do where his people might find rest in him. This is uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae um, who had Jews and Gentiles who were trying to have church together, right? And 
Y'all can be difficult enough for us to have church together, right? We're pretty homogenous. Southeastern Oklahoma, we have a lot of the same values and things. But you imagine Jews who had given their lives devoted to following the laws, and then Gentiles that are like, man, we just did whatever we want, right? We just pursued pleasure and did our things. And then you bring them together and worship. There were some conflicts. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to them about how they should conduct themselves. Colossians 2, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. These are questions about the law, by the way. Questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All of the law, the food and the drink, set apart for God, right? These things that were declared holy and other things unclean. The festivals, the new moons, the, the, the Sabbaths, all of those were a shadow of what was ultimately going to come in the person of Jesus Christ. Here's what happened. You and I, we were also enslaved to sin, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament. We were enslaved to sin, and we could not free ourselves. But God, in His goodness, He looked down upon us in our slavery to sin in our helplessness and hopelessness, and he chose to act on our behalf. So God sends his son, Jesus Christ, who came and fulfilled the law perfectly. Every food and drink, every festival day, every new moon, every Sabbath, Jesus kept it completely. And then Jesus went to the cross. And there on the cross... God took our sin, those of us who would come to trust, not in ourselves or our own goodness, but in in Jesus Christ, who would come to faith in him. God took our sin and he placed it on Jesus. And there on the cross, God poured out the just punishment for our sin and he poured it out on his son, Jesus. And for those of us who have come to faith in him, he took that perfect, righteous life who fulfilled the, the, the law in every way and he credited that to our account. So as a New Testament people, a new covenant people. We don't look at our status before God based on, you know, what laws we kept or what laws we failed to do, whether we'd offered the appropriate sacrifices. As a New Testament people, we look to the sacrifice that was once for all, Jesus Christ. We don't look to our work, but rather we look to His and we rest, not in our goodness, not in our works, what we've done or haven't done, but we rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Sabbath rest that we enter into is the rest in the finished work of Christ. So we have a greater Sabbath rest in Him. Um, Hebrews uh, chapters 3 and 4, if you were in my class on Wednesday nights, you know, you know this, but they encourage us to enter God's rest by resting from the works of the law and instead remaining steadfast in our, in our trust in Christ and His perfect work under the law. The Sabbath rest is a shadow of the rest we find in Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And this isn't talking about physical grunt manual labor. It's talking about people who are seeking after God. People who are being crushed under the weight of their sin. People who had seen that they'd fallen short of the glory of God and couldn't help themselves, who couldn't fix it. And Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. No more striving, no more straining, no more trying to be good enough, but it is resting in the goodness of God. It is resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ for us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So why do we not continue to observe the Sabbath, a lawful Sabbath, according to the pattern of the Israelites in the Old Testament? Because we rest now in Christ and in Him. It's finished. The work is done. We rest in Him. Uh, The final reason that we don't do that anymore I want to give you um, is that observance of the Sabbath, and I want to be clear here, it, it is an issue of conscience for the believers. If you'll look back to Colossians 2, 16 and 17, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul told the believers there not to let anyone pass judgment on them in questions of food or drink 
or uh, festivals or new moons or Sabbath. And so if you have this in your conscience, you feel led of the Spirit to practice Sabbath and to do it on a specific day, and you need to be obedient to God. If you don't feel that that is what you need to be doing, if you don't feel led of the Spirit, that doesn't seem to be an issue of conscience for you. Um, you certainly should not practice it legalistically. Now, I want to give you a few uh, recommendations as a people who can, we don't just get enslaved to our work here, we get enslaved to our play. As the people of God, if we're not careful, we'll look just like the world around us, and we will find that, man, our schedules are so full. There's not a moment to stop and to breathe and to remember the work of God on our behalf. If we haven't taken time aside to, re- to tell our kids to remember the work of Jesus Christ for us, but we just go and go and go and go. And so I, I would say to you, I do think that God set an example for us for a reason. We should not legalistically try to uphold uh, the seventh-day Sabbath, but we should um, recognize that we're not God. And if God rested, we sh- certainly should from our work. We should set aside times to rest and to remember. And so here's what this might look like for you. Um, some things to consider, I guess. First of all, consider your worship. Are you regularly setting aside time to worship the Lord? To remember what He's done on your behalf? Maybe remember your sin, how you've blown it in your life, how God saw you in that sin, and He knew you and He heard you, how God rescued you, how God offered His Son Jesus to suffer the death that you deserved, that you might ultimately live the abundant life in Him. So what does it look like for you to worship? Is there a rhythm for you uh, where you would set aside a time to worship? Now, what churches have done, the New Testament church, uh, because Jesus was raised on the first day of the week, they started worshiping on the first day of the week, which is why we worship on Sundays, right? It's kind of it's what's taken place throughout the history of the church. We worship on Sundays. It's a time we've set aside to gather with the body of Christ. You hear the preaching of the Word, to, to sing together as His church, right? This is a part of our Sabbath rest, if you will. Not one that's commanded by the law, but it's one that we pursue by the Spirit. Are you setting aside time for you and your family to worship? Maybe to gather with other people, your friends, to enjoy a meal, to feast a bit, and to remember the provision of God uh, for you. The second thing to consider is your work. Are you resting from your work? Or do you find yourself enslaved to it? Just about any moment of any day, you check the email or you answer the phone call or you're thinking about your work and your job. And I would just say, God set an example for us in creation. He rested on the seventh day. Are you setting aside a time where you simply choose not to pursue work where you're reminded that God is your provider, that He's at work even when you're at rest, to rest and to be refreshed in Him. The third thing here is uh, to think about your play. Are your hobbies and activities, and I'll just maybe speak very specifically, kids' sports or dance or cheer or band or whatever, I find if we're not careful in my home, they drive us. And there isn't a night to sit down and remember the work of God, to be renewed and to refresh. We're so dadgum busy, right, for an Eastern Oklahoma term. We get so busy. Or maybe it's your own hobbies. And you find yourself that your schedule is so full you can't stop. To cease and to rest, it's a blessing of God that was taught to us in creation. So I want you to consider that. Um, Have you found that even in the midst of your hobbies, you don't have time to gather with your church very often because your hobbies demand that you be gone? Uh, Maybe they're taking you away so you don't get to invest in your kids like you want to or other people. You don't get to serve others because you're so busy. Maybe as you look at your life, your faith is fruitless because you're so busy. The principle of Sabbath, it is no longer a commandment of the law on our life, but it is rather a matter of wisdom for us as the people of God, to look back to our Creator in creation, to see the benefit of the rest that He's given us, that we can stop, be reminded of His work, of His sovereignty, of His control in our lives, just to set aside a time to worship Him. Would you bow with me? Father, we do thank You. Uh, We look to, to You as a gracious God. 
who doesn't drive us, who doesn't demand labor out of us that's unceasing, but rather, God, you're a God who commanded us to stop, to be refreshed, and to be renewed. So, Lord, while we praise you, that that old Sabbath was just a, a shadow of what was to come, that we found rest in Jesus Christ and his work, we praise you for the cross. Father, I pray that we would be a people that lives wisely stops and rests and worships and remembers. Lord, I pray for the person here who, who finds themselves, as Jesus said, they're weary and they're burdened. They've tried everything the world has to offer. Can't ever find rest. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. For those of us who are too busy and doing too many things that aren't stopping to enjoy our great God, Lord, I pray that you might bring conviction to our heart and today would be the day of repentance. Lord, we just invite you to have your way among us. In Jesus' name, amen.